I see it says now streaming live. Does that mean that we're good to go, Joe? You are good to go. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Grants Committee meeting for September 20th, 2021. My name is Kathy Daigle Gammon. I'm counselor for District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadabit Valley. So welcome and call to order. What we're going to do is just make sure everybody's audio and video is working and we'll do a roll call. So Councilor Trish Purdy. Thank you. Yep. Um, Councilor for District 4 here, uh, Cove Harbor, Westfall, Lake Loon, and Sherry Brook. Good to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Trish. Um, Council Lindell Smith has sent his regrets. Councilor Lisa Blackburn, District 14. Good morning, everybody from beautiful downtown Beaver Bank and uh, District 14, Upper and Middle Sackville, Lucasville, and Beaver Bank. Good morning. Morning. Alex Handyside. I see your very nice photo up there, Alex, but. Oh, sorry, I, no, I, I pressed mute instead of unmute. Uh, good morning, Alex Handyside here. Good morning, Alex. Thank you. Leona Milne? Good morning. Oh, good morning, Lynn. My eyes had to go around the screen for a minute there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Joseph Allen has sent his regrets. Emily Jackson? I think you might be muted too, Emily. Good morning. I'm here. Great. Good morning. Um, Alana Baxter, our vice chair. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Morning. And Stefan Ludin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So we're all set. And with us, we have um, PJ Temple, team lead with finance and asset management. And legal assistant, Jill McElcuddy. Hi, Jill. Good morning, everyone. And um, Annie Sherry is with us as well. Good morning, Councillor. Good morning. So we'll move on on the agenda. Um, next is the approval of the minutes of August 9th, 2021. Um, any errors or omissions noted? Seeing none, then we have a motion to approve the minutes, please. I'll move that. I so. I'll second it, Lisa. Move we'll by Stefan, second by Lisa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Approval of the order of business and the approval of additions and deletions. Um, any additions or deletions, Jill? There are no additions or deletions from the clerk's office. Thank you so much. Hearing none, could we have a motion to approve the order of business? I so move. Thank you, Trish. Second? Second. Second? I think I heard Stefan first. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, business arising out of the minutes, there were none. Call for declaration of conflict of interests. Hearing none. Um, consideration of deferred business, there is none. Correspond correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Um, Jill, do we have any correspondence, petitions, or delegations? There were no correspondence, petitions, or presentations received by the clerk's office. Thank you. Um, presentations, none. Items brought forward were none. Now we get to the big part of the meeting, reports. So our first one is uh, tax relief for nonprofit organizations fiscal year 2021-22, proposed amendments to administrative order 2014-001, ADM program schedules and policies. And we've had a, a beautiful 56 page report to read on this. Um, 
and PJ Temple is available for any uh, questions that we might have. Now, as a point of order, shall we put the motion on the floor first and then discuss the report? Yes, if you could put the motion on, would be great, Councillor. Thank you so much. Would anyone care to put the motion on the floor for us, please? I could do that, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you very much. You want all, all nine points to be read? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get around with your coffee, folks. Here goes. Uh, I move. It is recommended that the Grants Committee recommend that Regional Council 1 approve the addition of 12 properties to Administrative Order 2014-001-80 ADM as detailed in Table 1 and the discussion section of this report at an estimated combined cost of $126,240 from operating account M311-8006 to approve a grant equivalent to the award previously received under the Tax Relief Program to the Association of Special Needs Recreation, 82 Cobblestone Lane, Muscadabit Harbor, and the Sackville Nova Scotia Lions Club, 101 Beaverbank Road, Lower Sackville, at an estimated combined cost of $14,417 from operating account M311-8006. Three, approve a grant of $1,186 to the North End Community Health Association, $2,295 to the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Society, and $1,287 to add some women and children from operating account M311-8006. Four, approve the removal of the City of Halifax nonprofit housing, 2415 Brunswick Street, uh, 2461-2463 Brunswick Street, and 2519 to 2523 Brunswick Street, Halifax, and the Dartmouth Nonprofit Housing Society, 53 Octoloni Street, Dartmouth, and add these same properties to Schedule 30. Five, approve the removal of the Tawak Housing Association, 6175 Lady Hammond Road, Halifax, from Schedule 29, and add this same property to Schedule 30. Six, approve the removal of Affirmative Ventures Association, 66 Lake Crest Drive, Dartmouth, and the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, 1 Tulip Street, Dartmouth, from Schedule 30, and add these same properties to Schedule 27. Number seven, approve the removal of the Halifax Haven Guest Home, 5879 Ingle Street, Halifax, from Schedule 30, and add this same property to Schedule 28. Number eight, approve the removal of the Canadian Cancer Society at 5826 South Street, Halifax from Schedule 29 and add this same property to Schedule 28. And finally, number nine, adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 2014-001-80 ADM as set out in Attachment 2 of this report, including adopting Attachments A through E attached to Attachment 2 and repeal and replace Schedules 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30 of the administrative order I so move. Thank you. Is there a seconder, please? All second. Alana? Okay. Thank you, Alana. All those in favor? Oh, sorry. Wait, no. Maybe we have the discussion before we vote on the motion. My apologies. I was jumping the gun. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about the reports? I had a quick question, actually. Thank you, Leona. Maybe we'll use the, the chats, um, and that way I'll be able to follow our questions. Leona, go for it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the first question I have, I actually only have one question. It's for Schedule 29, which is an Attachment D, page 36 of the 56-page report. This is Schedule 29 conversion from commercial to residential rate. And I think my, my general question is, um, I see a lot of organizations listed. Is this a standard process to change from commercial to residential tax rates? And if so, what, what is the difference in terms of the, res, in terms of the tax rates? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I would consider that probably the, the, in a sense, the lowest level of a tax reduction. Really, the overall sense of the program is that these are all registered nonprofit groups and charities. They're not 
commercial ventures. They're not for-profit enterprises. So a conversion from the commercial to residential rate is roughly about a two-thirds saving. So that's the difference between the commercial tax rate and the equivalent residential tax rate. So even at that, it's a significant saving for these groups. Um, the other schedules, let's say schedule 28, 27, 26, um, there can be additional reductions then from that residential rate. Um, but that's the basic, the baseline. So yes, that is a significant saving for all those listed. It is quite varied at this point. Is it a standard process to change from commercial to residential? Um, by standard, if you're eligible for acceptance into the program and council approve your addition, then that would be the starting point, yes. Um, it isn't a standard practice in terms of general tax billing, you would have to be in this program. So in our revenue department, all these properties that are accepted by council in the program are actually flagged, they're coded, and they will, the tax bills for those will be issued after council approves these awards. So unlike your standard taxpayer who would typically get two tax bills a year, the first in the spring, which is 50% of the prior year, and then a final bill, in the fall, um, you can imagine with 800 properties in this program, it takes us till the fall to actually do these calculations, do the report and, and get the approval done. So these groups, once council approve the awards, those tax bills, because they're coded in the system, they'll be printed separately and issued to the groups. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions on the reports? Yes, I have one. Um, my Thank question you. is, um, this is a long document and I've tried um, reading through, but can um, probably a question for Jill. Can you please clarify um, how you've assigned um, the businesses to each different um, tax reduction schedule? Like why are some eligible for 50% reduction of residential rate? Why are some eligible for 75, et cetera? Um, I would actually defer that over to PJ for this. She's yeah. the appropriate staff. Yes. Okay, this is the, how do we get to where we're at question. So prior to amalgamation, each of the four municipalities had their own programs. And generally speaking, they fell into two schedules. And then as amalgamation, everything got bunched in together. And really this is the underlying purpose for a program redesign. So once we've done this year's awards status quo, then you should expect, hopefully at the October meeting and certainly by November, staff will come forward and make a presentation to the committee on the proposed changes. So right now we're dealing with a very large legacy issue. In our opinion as staff, it's confusing, it's inconsistent. So for example, why would a paddling club pay no tax and a sailing or curling club is typically in schedule 29? In my opinion, only schedule 28 seems to be the place to land in the middle. Um, so what we're trying to do, so right now in the absence of clear criteria attached to each of those schedules, we have been following like with like. And in doing so, we've perp perpetuated those inconsistencies. And that creates confusion and frustration for applicants to the program. Uh, the other thing too is initially this was done by bylaw. And when you amend a bylaw, because the schedules are part of the policy, so to speak, whether it's the, the bylaw or today the administrative order, um, when you change a bylaw, you had to have a public hearing. And that meant that some groups uh, had the opportunity or took the opportunity to come to, uh, to council and present their case. Others didn't. So you may have a recommendation that's actually overturned in council, which results in a different level of tax relief compared to other groups. The other issue we faced was that up until a few years ago, um, this program has a fixed budget. And unless the budget for renewals 
was adjusted to reflect increases in assessed value or changes in municipal tax rates, we ended up with a waiting list of groups because we didn't have the budget to fund, while at the same time we had groups paying no tax at all. So arguably there was an inequity and unfairness there. So today, uh, through the regular budget process, uh, we will automatically, if it's required, request an increase to at least cover the renewals and then an increase in budget to accommodate uh, addition of, of more properties. So we have struggled with a very cumbersome process. And in my opinion, even the schedules and the naming of the schedules, like why do we start at 26 and not one or ABC? The naming of the schedules, it's in my view technical. It isn't self-evident. Well, what does 25% of the residential, 50% of the residential rate mean? And in 20 years, I had one person call to say, I think you gave me too much. They were on schedule 28. They understood that to be a 50% reduction of their tax bill, but the award was higher. And in fact, I explained to them, well, you're at the commercial rate. If you're a non-residential purpose, use, although you're not a business. So you've got that reduction and then you have a further 50%. So actually the percentage of the total tax relief was probably closer to 85 or 95%. And we wonder why we're confused. So we want to be able to rename the schedules in a way that you and I can understand to help guide the expectations of people applying to the program as to what level they might expect um, and to have criteria for each of these schedules so that we're like with like makes sense. So because council increased the level of tax relief for schedule 30, so that went from 25% reduction to 50, it doubled, that schedule really was introduced um, for affordable housing, primarily. Because over time, as groups have been added and subject to the budget availability and so forth, um, we've, we had a couple of properties in there that actually would get a higher level of tax relief. They serve more special needs, like a, a shelter, for example. So they'd be different. So we've started with the single largest schedule. Schedule 30 represents all in excess of 50% of the total program properties. So that was the place to start with like with like. So that meant that that's added several recommendations to your list and pushed it out to nine, but it is a start of like with like. So that's how we got to where we're at. It's a hint in a way as to what we will be proposing in the redesign. But we decided that the redesign has to follow after this, otherwise complete and utter chaos. And we also want to be able to have these decisions such that we can issue the tax bills to these groups in October, not teetering on the brink in March as we approach fiscal year end and possibly run out of time. So this report is a little longer Mm -hmm. It's 56 pages can be attributed to attaching the schedules to it, um, but that is the format for the public domain. And if once council has approved those changes, those schedules are posted online along with the administrative order. I might add that this program is most essential to those nonprofits in terms of their sustainability and in terms of their budgeting and the times that this report can get through council and then, uh, invoices are prepared just for managing their cash flow and uh, understanding the impact of their budgets. It's, it's critical to many of the nonprofits, this program. Yep. It is, the, the tax bills can vary enormously. Um, and one of the things that we would like to address in our redesign, um, so let's use a practical example. If you looked at schedule 27, you'll see that many of the groups there are licensed registered um, childcare providers. So daycare or preschool. The criteria right now is 
they get a conversion from the commercial rate because they're non-residential and then a 75% reduction. So there's the appearance of you all get the same. What the program hasn't been able to do to this point is account for the significant variance in land values. So you'll find there's a childcare center on Devonshire Avenue that is still paying a significant amount of tax even after the uh, formula has been applied. Whereas that same operation uh, in Nikumtar, they pay a fraction of that. So the issue is sort of one of affordability and how can we moderate this program so that those that are in high value areas, and that's not exclusively downtown Halifax and Dartmouth, you'll find some um, in growth areas, Fall River, I think is, is an example. Porter's Lake might be another, um, waterfront property. So there are all these factors that can push the tax relief very high. Um, so we're trying to standardize and moderate that market flux where uh, even homeowners are aware, well, I didn't do anything and my taxes have gone up significantly because there's a new development down the street or it's a hot market. So again, that's what we're trying to moderate through the redesign. We're going to look forward to all of that. PJ. <laughs> It'll be chaos because it is a change. Um, but uh, as I said informally to Councillor Mace one day, we cannot all move to Mushaboon where land values are lower. We, some of these groups have to be located in where there's a market for their goods and products. Example might be Neptune Theatre. Um, they have to be located in close proximity to the clients they serve. Metro Turning Point Shelter would be another example. So again, it's not always by choice that we want to be in the groovy vibe kind of location. Um, some of this is necessitated by the availability of property or the access to, to the clients we serve. Are there any other questions? I have one question, but I'd like mm -hmm. the committee members to go first if there's any other questions for the report for PJ. That was a really great explanation. Um, I have one further question. So it sounds like some of the ones that are in Schedule 27 right now that are at 75% reduction from the residential rate, mm -hmm. we're moving at 50%. Um, are there any organizations where that's going to have a significant budget impact to them? And if so, um, are there any thoughts to like phasing them to the new amount or are they moving there in one year? Thank uh, you. Through you, Madam, through you, Madam Chair. Um, for most, this is a good news story in terms of moving them up in level of tax relief. The exception to that, are, there are four properties that were on schedule 26. This goes back to the year of the ARC. In other words, this is a legacy issue. Those four properties, three are owned by Halifax Nonprofit Housing Society and one owned by Dartmouth Nonprofit Housing Society. Those properties were placed at full exemption in the belief that this was going to be an incentive and those savings would be reinvested in the preservation of a heritage property. In actual fact, there was absolutely no way to monitor the reinvestment of those savings in heritage preservation. And in fact, both have since um, applied for and received capital grants. So recently, uh, last year in 2020, Council did accept the staff recommendation that we not use tax relief, which is a recurring annual form of operating grant for heritage restoration, and that in fact, capital grants, cash grants, are much better at monitoring that um, purpose, if you will. And in fact, I remember former councillor Gloria McCluskey asking in, in council, in public, PJ, how do you know if this saving is applied to heritage? And the honest answer is we don't. So those four properties as proposed would be taken from that schedule and they would be put in schedule 30 with other affordable housing. Now, both of those groups have large portfolios in the program. The like city of Halifax probably has a total of 17. So although they will lose some tax relief on those three properties, 
the rest of their portfolio, the other 14, will get a doubling in the value of tax relief. So that will more than offset this change. City of uh, Dartmouth, or now called Dartmouth Nonprofit Housing, one property would receive a reduction in tax relief. They have 68 properties in the program in total. So they will have a significant, again, doubling in their area. So both will have a net gain, if you will, in terms of tax relief. But it helps with consistency going forward. Um, because otherwise it prompts, well, I want what they've got. Or why not me? Is this, you know, bias? Is this unfair? So it is about standardizing. And both those groups will, depending on today's uh, decision of the committee, we would um, send them uh, an email letter of notification in advance on explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it. Thank you, PJ. I see that um, Councillor uh, Smith has joined us. I just wanted to be able to welcome him. Hello, Councillor Smith. Um, Emily, I, I apologize for interrupting. You had a, a follow-up question. Oh, no, I was going to say thank you. That was a great explanation. And it's great that you guys were able to. Um, I'm having difficulty so hearing you, Emily. Oh, I might be too far from my. Uh, I was going to say it's great that you were able to um, create some consistency without there being any like big losers in the program. It's great. Thank you. Leona, did you have another question? Did I see that? Yes. I did. Just a quick question. Um, in terms of the process for organizations to apply to this program, could mm -hmm. you just describe what the application process is like? And is it fairly easy for custom or for people who are not in this program to apply to it later on? Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. We open the program in September of every year. Um, and certainly we could accept applications prior to that, but officially we will put out and have issued uh, a notice. The notice goes in the print media and also online. So the form is online for people to fill out. We have in effect two timelines. We set the application to add a property is November 30th of the prior year. So. For those who want to add a property to the program for the 2022 program, they have until November 30th to apply this year. The reason for that timing is if we got a high volume of applications to add, or even a few, but a very high value, bear in mind, some of the larger groups in this uh, program could have a tax bill of five, $600,000 a year at the commercial rate. We need to know that so that we have sufficient time to make a request through our budget process if we feel we need an increase in the program's budget. So that, that is a, an attempt to try and avoid declining somebody just because we don't have the money. Um, now we will accept uh, additions up to March 31st, but for us to consider adding them to the program, that may be subject to budget capacity. I think the form is, is reasonably easy to fill out. I would, in the redesign, make some minor amendments. For example, we ask groups for the property identification number. That's a technicality that few know. And realistically, do they need to know it? We could probably look that up and fill that out. Um, they should know their assessment account number. That would be on their tax bill, but even some are a little iffy over that. So at a minimum, we need the accurate address, civic address, the property. We, could, we can help fill in the technicalities they're missing and we have no objection to doing so. But getting the right civic address for the property is important and not to confuse it with a mailing address. And you'll see one correction in our records management. Um, I think it's the Deanery Cooperative. Uh, we had them in the schedule under their mailing address, which could be somebody's home. So those are the technicalities that we're looking for uh, on the application. Now, if you're new to the program and you're looking to add a property, you would send us your articles of incorporation. For some, that might be called a charter or a constitution bylaws, uh, financial statement for the prior year, and proof of ownership. So for many, that would be a deed. 
Now, in rare circumstances, we might have a group that was, you know, incorporated in the year dot, and they don't have a copy of their deed, in which case staff would go to the land registry and see if we could locate it. But again, we'll help with those technicalities. Um, if an organization leases an entire property, so an example of that in this year's report would be Adsum and the North End Clinic, it's the entire property. So we can attribute and tax them and bill them directly, then they would include a copy of the lease agreement. And so with the lease agreement, we're checking to see they're responsible for the full payment of tax and so forth. So it's really once we've got that basic fundamental uh, information that we'll retain on file. And when it comes to renewal, uh, we have what's called, and we changed this last year to simplify it again, uh, we're calling it a confirmation form. When we call it a renewal, I think many groups thought they were applying for acceptance into the program. And so that got people squirrely and, and afraid. Uh, we also asked for an annual financial statement. So we were filing hundreds of sheets of paper simply because we've always done it this way and nobody told us to change. So, you know, an obvious question to the director of finance, why are we doing this? Like, what am I looking for in this financial statement? Uh, are we looking to see they've declared this as a grant or how can I tell how they spent the savings? So and with that, we do still have the opportunity if we felt there was a justifiable need to ask a group for an update, but 100% of them, no. So essentially, once you're in the program, it's this property that every year along with your tax bill will be the confirmation form. And there we're really looking for simple things. Have you sold the property? Do you intend to sell it? Uh, has there been a change to the tenancy? within that property. Those are the key things. And then we're going from 800 to these four are signaling there has been or maybe a change. And then we can focus our resources there. That's a great answer, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, PJ. Uh, as someone who's gone through this process, I will say that the staff make it very easy and are very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Phew. We didn't decline. <laughs> Alana, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I read this last evening and I can't seem to find what I was looking for just now, but it seems to me that it's being proposed for the redesign process, the pending redesign process that organizations will no longer get a reminder that the due date is approaching because it's being changed from March 31st to September 30th, it probably was, if my memory serves me correctly. I didn't really get why uh, changing the due date was kind of a reason to no longer send out reminder emails. Um, as was suggested by Councillor uh, Daigle Gammon, um, I recognize many of these organizations from my past work, uh, even current work, and they are this this important this uh, tax exemption is really important. So, is it a workload issue really when it comes down to it that? that reminder email isn't generated to them, get your application in or confirmation form of your current status? Or is it is it really about that because you changed the due date, they don't need a reminder? Would you explain that please? I know it's a micro uh, topic, but I just, I just know how busy a lot of these nonprofits are and sometimes they do overlook things. Sure, after uh, you, Madam Chair. So the change that we've made was to the prorating penalty. Um, so everybody, you know, the renewals due March 31st, that hasn't changed. What we had to do was go back and amend the administrative order because so relatively few, but nevertheless, 
some repeat. Um, if they haven't renewed, they haven't complied with the, the eligibility requirements of the program, we ended up going to council to recommend their removal from the program. And to your point, that got overturned every year because, well, there was no preparation. This is really important. So recognizing it's really important, these groups need to be on schedule and it becomes unmanageable for us to try to override their own ability to self-manage. So in preference to that all or nothing, we went back to council with an amendment to the policy called prorating. So, and this is only in relation to renewals, there's prorating for other things that I'll explain after, but we'll focus on this. So instead of the all or nothing, we said, well, how about there's a penalty. We will deduct one day for each day late. So that way, in a sense, the group self-manage. You want to leave it till December 4th, you're going to have a larger penalty than, oops, April 2nd, it's in. So we felt that was fair in terms of their abilities. Um, and then to be honest, the self-serving part of it was we added a three month grace period, April, May, to the end of June. And we did the grace period, not because we were trying to be wishy-washy, but to say, we need the time to identify these groups, send them the notification letter, because we don't do everything by a listserv. We don't have a listserv and I'll explain why. Send them the notification and have them have time to get it back to us or answer any questions or confusion. So in effect, the pro-rating deductions start July 1st. During that three month period, that's where we're sending the reminder. If there's nothing happening out there, we send a registered letter. And by sending a registered letter, we have proof that you received it or it was returned to us unclaimed. And that was about, well, I didn't get it. It got lost in the mail, Norman's on vacation, so forth. Um, so that way, it's some security for us to say to the committee, to council, we have tried within our reason, you know, we've given them every reasonable chance. So really what we're proposing here is that the onus doesn't fall on us to remind you repeatedly, and that in that confirmation form, we'd have a notice there that says, if you are late with your confirmation form, prorating will start July 1st. So, you know, as stated in bold in the report, it is about trying to move these groups to self-managing a little more because now there are so many of them and some very large portfolios. Uh, we don't have the staff resources. And personally, I don't think it's a strong business case to hire more staff to send out persistent reminders to groups no offense. Um, so that's that's really what we're trying to get to. I mean, council or the grants committee could, could decide otherwise, but um, as one councillor pointed out when we were making those initial amendments, well, it's like applying for a job, but you didn't apply, but you expect the job. <laughs> so um, we have tried to simplify it in such a way that it's not too arduous. And if you look at the number of default, if you will, um, that's a very small number out of the total. So I think we have made huge progress. When I first started with this 20 years ago, the compliance rate was probably 5%. So in actual fact, over that 20 years, we've turned that around. The non-compliance rate is less than 5%. So they're doing better. And I think by simplifying the program, and in my view, and I'm biased because my background's education, but if ever a program needed a guidebook for participants, this would be one. Tax is not intuitive. Great, thank you, PJ. We have no other questions. Will we call for the question? Question. Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. PJ, you are the expert on this. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and we're keeping you on the hot seat for a little while. That's uh, fine. Yep. The uh, next item on our agenda is uh, Committee uh, Impact Executive Summary of Grant Submissions. And um, so from the minutes and some of our previous emails, we as a, a committee had some questions about what happens, um, and I believe this is what it is, when the grants, community grants have all been done, is there any feedback to this committee to say, um, this percentage, uh, we're able to fulfill our obligations and um, are being able to do the work that they requested? And so PJ, we were just wondering if in terms, is, it, is there a process? Does that kind of information come back to this committee? Okay. Um, so Madam Chair, at this point, no, it doesn't. What will happen is um, in the community grants program, those who receive a, a reward, an award will be issued along with the check is uh, a final reporting form, simple two pager. And really that for us, and that's just proof, did the project actually proceed? Um, along with that, they would provide a simple proof of payment, which could be an invoice paid or a canceled check. So there really all you're looking for is, was the nature of the project that was funded by council undertaken? Did they comply with the terms and conditions of funding? In a few examples, these are usually mostly capital grants, but not always. A group may start a project, but be unable to finish it by March 31st. In those cases, typically staff would uh, award a carry forward, meaning we're not going to sit there March 31st and say, we want our money back. Um, and sometimes those are circumstances beyond their control. So a capital project could be delayed by weather. In this environment, it could be availability of trades or materials. So there's all manner. And sometimes the board's changed. We don't have a clue, right? So they need to regroup. So occasionally you may have a carry forward of an award. Um, if something went totally south on us um, and we have a default, in our view. In the past, we would have, well, I call it the naughty list, but basically we would come to the grants committee and say the following are in default. They received a grant for X. They didn't report. We have sent reminder letters. We sent a final letter by registered mail and still nothing. Um, in those circumstances, the group may have dissolved or they're just not responding to, to us. Um, now, for some people that that may have seemed a little harsh because you're putting that default list before the committee. Um, and again, the question rightfully arose, well, is that a little harsh if it's in perpetuity? So again, I think in the yet to be done, and I'm, I'm suggesting probably for 2022, we are looking at some changes to the community grants program, and that will be one element of it. Should that be in the public domain? Is it too punitive? Um, should there be a limit, let's say of seven years, which is your typical um, municipal standard for archiving materials? Um, certainly that could be an information report to the grants committee that says of 111 awards in 2021, we've received final reports for 110 and one is carried forward due to X, Y, Z. Right. <coughs> What's the wish of the committee? Um, just Alana as vice chair and I have gone back through some of the minutes. And so when we were trying to recapture the, a bit of the education that we had gotten as a, a new committee, uh, that was one of the things that came up. So. Mm -hmm. Information report to the grants committee on the results, I guess, of the community grants program. Would that be the wish of the committee or? I'd be up for that, Madam Chair. 
Madam Chair, if I could ask for clarification, because um, I looked at some of the wording, at, you know, <laughs> in discussion with Jill and thought, oh, re reporting on impacts. Um, we wouldn't typically say they mended the roof and therefore it's, you know, the leak has been fixed. Um, so I, I really am looking for the amount of detail because an information report that simply says there were this many awards, this many reported on time, this was carried forward, and these four are in default and have been issued a registered letter of notice. Like, mm -hmm. is that your expectation in terms of the accountability? If That's manageable I, for us, I think. If I could just interject for one second too, um, <clears throat> perhaps this is something that we could um, speak a little bit offline because within your terms of reference, I'm not sure that we have you as a committee have the ability to direct staff to do um, a report like that, but there probably is a mechanism available that uh, perhaps staff initiate it to respond back from um, past minutes or something like that. I, like I said, if we could just uh, have a little bit of time just to look into your terms of reference so that we can make sure we get back to you what, what your wish is. That sounds great, uh, Jill. I think most of us would agree with that. I, I would be hesitant to say impact because to do an impact report is a very significant piece of work. Um, mm -hmm. That is usually done within the organizations themselves and how they do their AGM reports, et cetera. Uh, so, but I think, you know, if, if we knew around the uptake, so to, to find out uh, where we can reside and how we can receive back information, I think that would be great. So we can do a little bit of work on that. Um, is everyone satisfied with, with that? Just a pause, check things out. And so we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is of a similar vein. It was the discussion on funding allocations. In previous minutes, the question was asked and answered, um, but the question was, if there is this budget of money envelope, for example, community grants or whatever, and uh, it is not entirely spent, or they're in default, and uh, or if, if there is money left over, what happens to that funding that's left over? And the answer I believe we received is it goes back into the general fund, but if we could just have a little bit more clarity on that, please, it would be great, PJ. Sure, uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so far, in my experience, there are sort of one of two routes. So let's say if we have completed the community grants program for 2021, and I think this year we have $235 left. Um, sometimes the balance remaining in, in our grants programs, which is in fiscal services. It's not in a departmental budget. Fiscal services is where we transfer monies to unrelated third parties. On occasion, council has received unsolicited requests for donations. So an example might be the Downey Wenchuk Foundation. That was $25,000. Uh, another was the Vimy Foundation, which was about a commemorative garden, albeit not in the province of Nova Scotia, it's in France. So because those kinds of requests don't fit within a, an established municipal grant program, they may come to finance to make a recommendation to council. And when you're making a recommendation to council, you have to identify the source of funds if you propose or recommend that we fund them. So in some years, let's say the Vimy Foundation, we had a balance remaining in the um, community museums. And so when we went forward with recommendation, it was basically, if you wish to grant this donation, here's where we would suggest the money comes from. So it's kind of comparable. It was a historical context and there were monies in this budget. So they may be expended on other projects, but that really is a function of how much balance money do you have and how much time do you have to write a report and go all the way through the approval process. 
the more common one, which would apply to all municipal grant programs, and in fact, all budget allocations, is um, it would go back to what I call treasury, which is really the end of year surplus deficit. Technically, these are called operating funds, and our practice is we cannot accrue operating funds. Uh, so these end of year surplus, let's say, would then be divided out of council's decision amongst the different reserves. So typically our, any balance, our $235 left this year would go to what's called a general contingency reserve. And again, that's the same kind of reserve that if we got an unsolicited request, we have no balance remaining, then really our only alternative to council would be either withdraw some funds from the reserve, decline the request, or defer the request to the budget process for the following year. So you're lining up your options and sometimes you're making a recommendation in relation to those options in terms of uh, is the timing of this request critical or not. So, so basically there's two roads. The most common is end of year surplus. Um, there's only one exception I, I can think of that was a capital grant. The group still couldn't confirm their ability to proceed and the risk of issuing the money and allowing them to carry it forward, we judged to be too great. And instead, we asked the money to go to a reserve. And the following year, when they were able to demonstrate an ability to proceed, a project readiness, then the funds were issued. But we wouldn't do that very often. That's very labor intensive and it gets a little technical and overwhelming for the group itself. Right. Thank you very much for that great explanation, PJ. Okay. We're good. We're yeah. golden. Anybody have any questions <laughs> for PJ about that? No? We're all good. Um, so moving on on our agenda, and thank you very much, PJ. Uh, Ooh, Madam Chair, can I add something? Absolutely. I'm very sorry. I don't wish to delay. But one of the things that I do tell groups is, and I think it's important for them to understand, um, if we don't expend the, the fund for that program fully, it doesn't get transferred to any other part of our operation. So I tell people, we're not buying new filing cabinets March 31st. We're not going on conferences. This money will go to more a, a larger collective surplus and some other program, some other uh, municipal expenditure may be underfunded. So we're all kind of playing our role and we're not squirreling away money because it's mine, you know, it's ours. So uh, I think it's important for groups to understand we have no vested self-interest in underspending so that we can squirrel it away and spend it on some other favorite project. Doesn't work that way, but I think groups need to know that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, added items, we have none. So the date of our next meeting is October 18th, 2021. And hopefully phase five will be there and oh. uh, get oh. a conversation of in-person or virtual or something different, but <laughs> I'll look forward to that. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Everybody wants to stay. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that. Well, have a great week, everyone. Don't forget to vote if you haven't voted already. I'm heading out now. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, PJ. Always a pleasure. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Take Thank care, you for everyone. your questions, too. Um, to all of you, there's no such thing as a bad question. And from teaching to teach is to learn. So your questions help inform us. And if there's areas where people are collectively struggling, 